get started. Um, and we'll, I want to leave enough time to go over the, the quiz at the end. Okay, but it was just the quiz is just based on the reading, and I'm not going to cover the reading. So it's just to be able to help you. Um, all right, so I think most of you know me. <laughs> so I'm uh, Emmy Hartnett, and I'm going to talk on pediatric retina. It, a lot of these slides, I, I didn't, it's, it's hard for me because I know the residents and the students, and then the number of people who actually show up varies, and I don't know who's coming and who's not. So some of this you may have had before. I don't, I don't know um, in pediatric retina or pediatric ophthalmology. I don't know if they talk on RLP. So some of it I'll uh, flop over, go over quickly. And then I want to be able to get to the other retina cases because some of them are very important for you to know as you're taking care of patients that you might be referred by pediatric ophthalmology. So we're going to start with retinopathy prematurity, which is a leading cause of childhood blindness. And on, on your right there is the worst stage called stage 5 ROP. It looks like there's a cataract. There's no cataract. There's a quiz right there. Thanks. Um, it's actually a, a scar that's behind a crystal clear lens, and behind that scar is a total retinal detachment. So it's even with uh, successful surgery, the vision is poor, but we still try because a little bit of, of vision in the in the child can they can use it very effectively. And we also try because there are a lot of there's a lot of research to restore or improve visual So what we know now may be totally different in 20 years. So we want to give them all the chance we can, but. We think of vision loss in ROP from abnormal angiogenesis or blood vessel growth, and that's what causes a stage five ROP, where you get the tractional detachment, that, that scarring that pulls the retinal detach the retina off. <coughs> and there have been several multicenter clinical trials that have shown we can reduce the risk of, of vision loss from stage five ROP by either cryotherapy. 50% uh, risk, we really don't use that anymore. We don't use cryotherapy. Or even if we go in earlier and use laser at a less severe stage, type 1 mm -hmm. ROP, we can, we can reduce the risk from 50% to about 9%, and it was significant. So that's what we usually do, and we'll go over those later. But there are also other causes of vision loss in ROP, and it's not always related to this aberrant angiogenesis. There can be abnormal perfusion on neurons, these neurovascular effects where either you don't get enough oxygen, nutrition to neurons, or maybe other types of signaling mechanisms. And, and how we know this is that 25% of the treated infants who did well in the early treatment ROP study, these were like successful, successfully treated infants, still only had 2060 vision or worse. So there's something else going on. And, and potentially it could be from the laser too. Is, but this, he, is this threshold ROP associated, like, correlated with the stage of ROP? Or? We're going to go over that a little bit later, but this was actually for type 1 ROP, the 2060 vision. And then there also can be vision loss from extreme pr prematurity, so extremely low gestational age infants who never developed ROP at all. So these would be 23 weekers. They had reduced vision and ERG responses even at age 6. So there clearly are other things going on in premature birth and potentially in ROP or, or the stresses surrounding ROP. And when you think about it, you know, we only think about the retina circulation when we talk about ROP. We think of the fact that so, so the retinal vessels are, are uh, fully developed in the human at term birth. So when a baby is born premature, they don't have fully developed retina, retinal vessels. And then they have all these stresses on top of that that lead to retinopathy prematurity. Um, so we only think of the retinal vessels because we can see them, right? But there's a lot going on with the um, regression of the hyloid and also the choroid, which we really don't see in the premature infant, and the effects of the oxygen and metabolic demands on the neural retina. So the neural retina needs the oxygen. The photoreceptors use a lot of oxygen, right? 
and they may continue in their development, but if they have insufficient or damaged vasculature in the choroid or the retinal circulation, they may not develop appropriately. They may not have the right signaling molecules. So there's a lot to learn yet. So just to remember that. Did I get your question completely, or do you need to see what threshold ROP is? It's a, it's a level of severity of the uh -huh. blood vessels and of something called plus disease. And I'll show you some of that. Okay. The other thing that makes it difficult when we look at, you know, we tend to look in the literature when we're looking at different ways of treatment because now there's a lot of interest in anti-angiogenic agents like anti-VEGF agents in ROP. And so we look in the literature and, and studies, mostly case series, are presented, but ROP is very different in the United States, other areas of the country. There are areas like Mexico and also India where they still have oxygen-induced retinopathy. One of the things that we learned in the United States, like in the 1950s, was that high oxygen at birth, unregulated oxygen, 100% oxygen, which was what the incubators were able to you know, provide, that that caused ROP, retrolental fibroplasia, it was then called. And so there were a lot of efforts to improve the regulation of oxygen, to be able to monitor it. We have resources, like we have enough nurses or respiratory therapists to make sure that the ventilators, ventilator support is working. And a lot of these countries just don't have it. Even if they're able to blend the oxygen or, re or monitor the oxygen, they may only have nurses that are doing everything. So there is still oxygen-induced retinopathy. So where the blood vessels develop, they're bigger babies, they're older babies, their vessels, their retinal vessels develop, but they actually get oxygen damage to the retinal vessels, and they have broad areas of avascular retina. That's different than the ROP we see in the United States. There can be differences in maternal fetal risks as well, like preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a very interesting uh, condition that affects uh, obviously the mother who's who's pregnant, and the interesting thing about um, preeclampsia, uh, Julia Schulman, who was a fellow with us and is now practicing in New York, she uh, reviewed data from a large uh, uh, group of patients out of Utah, and we looked at the effects. The question was, does preeclampsia increase the risk of ROP? The problem is that preeclampsia is so linked to premature birth and, and is a risk for premature birth, and premature birth and is, is so linked to ROP that you get into this collider bias, right? So when we looked at mothers with preeclampsia, mothers without, kids with ROP, kids without, maternal or preeclampsia actually was a risk factor for ROP. But when we only uh, restricted our subgroup to infants with ROP and looked at whether or not mothers had preeclampsia or not, it looked protective. So we are interpreting that, that either preeclampsia may provide some kind of, we have some uh, uh, experimental evidence that it may provide like a preconditioning effect that makes the infant less susceptible to ROP. But it also could be that there are more severe risks associated from premature birth on ROP than preeclampsia. So it's a complicated issue. But resources, as I mentioned, also you know, other things that cause premature birth, poor nutrition, infection, maternal infection, and then also diagnostic ability. So there have been several studies out that, sh that looked at um, you know, how uh, uh, physicians would diagnose severe ROP or threshold ROP or type 1 ROP and they didn't have agreement. So if you're if you're saying that you're you're waiting till a patient has an infant has more severe ROP like threshold disease which is more severe and you're enrolling them in a trial the outcome might be much worse than if you enroll a type 1 ROP. So there are a lot of things that, that make it complex. <coughs> um, so what we do know is that ROP is associated with high oxygen at birth. When, when uh, kids in the US were first, when it was first like recognized that there was this thing called retrolental fibroplasia, they did a bunch of different studies 
And they exposed animals, healthy animals, full term, not premature, and they exposed them to conditions that, that were present in those incubators at the time. And so some of, you know, they didn't know if it was temperature, they didn't know what it was, right? And so one of the things that came up was high constant oxygen caused this damage to the blood vessel, followed by blood vessel growth into the vitreous. Clinical trials then were found. Arnold Patz was one who, who really showed that high oxygen uh, increased ROP. And then reduced oxygen levels in the U.S. virtually caused ROP to disappear for a while. But as it more extremely premature infants, either low gestational age or birth weight, were able to be survived, we start to see it in older infants. So we recognize there are other risks besides high oxygen at birth. And the risks include fluctuations in oxygen. And so people have studied oxygen. They looked at low oxygen, they looked at supplemental oxygen, and, and the studies have shown that it may depend on when during the prenatal course you get the high oxygen, that it may actually reduce ROP. Low oxygen at birth reduced ROP, but it increased mortality in several big clinical trials, the support study. The BOOST study. So these were international multicenter clinical trials. So we know what, we, what we're starting to think is maybe low oxygen at birth, and then at some point when you start to see the vascular, vascularly active form, so tortuosity and dilation of retinal vessels, blood vessels growing into the vitreous, that's what makes up type 1 or threshold ROP, that that may be the time to increase the oxygen level. Oxidative stress has often been touted for ROP. I believe it is a risk factor, but it's more complex than being able to uh, give like vitamin E to infants. Those studies have not been shown to um, uh, reduce ROP safely. And so there's no really strong evidence of the benefit of antioxidants in uh, preventing ROP so far. What about nutrition and body weight effects? So there was a lot of experimental evidence that showed that poor growth after birth was associated with um, less normal retinal vascularization and more severe ROP. And the, um, this was also associated with low insulin-like growth factor one. So a clinical st trial actually infused insulin-like growth factor uh, one into babies that they figured out was a, it was about the same level as what it would be if they were like in utero. And they found no, no effect. But they also had a lot of trouble with the study. Like they didn't quite get the levels in the babies to be the levels that they wanted. There were, uh, it was right around the time when the oxygen studies came out, so, so neonatologists were worried about mortality, so they increased the oxygen levels, so we still don't know about that. Um, and then genetics. And so this is where, you know, there are all these, there's no one gene that's associated with ROP. But when you look at the studies throughout the world, they're mixing apples and oranges. You know, they have extreme, when we did extremely low birth weight infants, those born under 1,000 grams, we found that variants in brain-derived neurotrophic factor were associated with severe ROP. Whereas if you look at other studies, they include infants that are not quite as premature, and so they found other aspects. So there's been no generalizable replication of so just to go over, high oxygen at birth is definitely a risk factor. Other oxygen stresses may be associated with ROP, like fluctuation in oxygen, oxidative stress, nutritional effects, genetics. So when we, um, so, so this is, some of this, I'm assuming you, you read the assignment you had for this talk, so that's part why you, I'm not going over the really basic stuff about how the retina vessels uh, you know, grow and all that. But um, one of the things that, that, we, that can be, I think, very confusing is the idea of the phases of, OI, of ROP or OIR, oxygen-induced retinopathy. And those are usually based on experimental models 
That's phase one used to be vasoobliteration, phase two used to be vasoproliferation. That compared to the stages. So the phases were developed in the 1940s or 50s by Ashton. The stages didn't happen until the 1990s, okay? But we can align them, and the, and the phase one probably is a little bit different, or is, a, is different now, because we no longer have big babies who have high oxygen that causes damage. In the United States, we have babies that may get some oxygen damage, but they also have a delay in the vascularization out toward the aura serrata. Okay, so there are two things that go on, and that's increased with fluctuations in oxygen. So the phase one, we see the compromised physiologic vascularity or vasoobliteration and delayed physiologic retinal vascular development. And phase two is the vasoproliferation or the growth of blood vessels in the eye. And in the human, you might say there's a phase three because none of the animal models develop stage five ROP or retinal detachment you know, well. So these are, this would be uh, the, the stage that occurs with stages four and five, okay? So that's like a brief, this is kind of another way to look at it. This is ROP, so in the human, you see the optic nerve down at the left, the retinal blood vessels grow, and there's a very faint line. I don't know if there's a pointer here, but I think you can see that. Yeah, there is one in there. Is this it? All six. <laughs> this looks like a yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> yeah, because I, I want to make sure. And you can see that. You know, please stop me if you have questions like, or if it doesn't make sense. If, you know, just, just let me know because. Oops. Ah, there we go. Okay, so here's the line, okay? And then stage two is a ridge that has a three-dimensional kind of volume. And this may both be in phase one. And you don't have to worry about phase one and two. It's just when you read it, and people confuse it. And I'm just trying to make sense out of it. And then stage three is when you have blood vessels that grow into the vitreous. That's phase two. And then this is stage four ROP. So you can see all this is retinal detachment and scar tissue, and it's blended. And if we have time, I'll show you how we treat this with a lens sparing vitrectomy. I have a brief video. This would be considered phase three. So how do we classify? So maybe I should have started this earlier, but we talk about where normal vessels grow. So if you've got a really, uh, you know, extremely premature infant, the blood vessels, like 22 weeks, the blood vessels are only in the posterior pole. 22 weeks is vasculogenesis. Those are where you have angioblasts or these um, endothelial precursor cells that actually migrate from the outer neuroblastic level layers, so in embryology, and they grow up from the outer retina to the inner retina. And they do that uh, because they're, grow they're, they're migrating toward a um, chemotactic gradient of stromal derived factor. So not VEGF, okay, so other factors. That's probably what we get in zone one. And then in zone two, we have, a, a, so zone one is twice the different distance to the macula uh, circle that radius is equal to twice the distance to the fovea. Now that's hard because the premature baby doesn't have a fovea, so you're like estimating. So how do we figure out zone one? We take a 28 diopter lens, and you're looking with an indirect ophthalmoscope, and you're holding the lens so that the optic nerve is right in the center, and then you see what vessels fall into that image. And if you have even some vessels that that don't make it all the way to the edge of that sort of field of view, that's considered zone one. So you can see that they're all different kinds of zone one eyes, right? You could have the whole 12 clock hours, right, not making it, and that would be very bad zone one, but you might only have one, and that may not be so bad. And then zone two probably occurs through angiogenesis, where the blood vessels, 
So you have existing blood vessels that where you get budding angiogenesis, so the endothelial cells proliferate and migrate, and they usually go out toward a gradient of vascular endothelial growth factor, which is produced by astrocytes, okay? So that's, or angioblasts, and I'm sorry it's so confusing, but it's partly because of the difficulty in study human eyes, so we use rodent models, and they don't necessarily align as a cell type, or even sometimes the, uh, the the growth factors. So zone two is, the, is a circle centered on the optic nerve. The radius is the distance from the optic nerve to the nasal or serrata. And you're, the reason this isn't drawn all the way is that you're given a disc diameter. Like you're, when you're trying to figure out is this zone three, you look in nasally. And if the vessels, there's no ROP and the vessels fall within a disc diameter of the or serrata from the two nasal clock hours, that's considered zone three. So you can see that zone, or zone, yeah, that's considered zone three. So you consider, you can see how you could have a zone three eye that where the, you know, the zone two over here technically might be pretty posterior. So there, you know, there are differences. And then zone three is this, um, the temporal crescent. So in other words, as long as the vessels in uh, reach the two clock hours nasally without ROP, any avascular retina is it's just considered zone three. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Um, and then when we look at the vascular activity, okay, so this is what makes up plus disease, or this is what makes up threshold or type one ROP. And so we have vascular tortuosity and dilation, and we talk about quadrants of involvement, and that's an example of plus disease. So type one ROP, this is what was the 15% risk in the uh, early treatment ROP study was zone one, any stage of ROP with plus disease, zone one, stage three ROP without plus disease, or zone two, stage two or three with plus disease. And, pl and plus disease was defined in two quadrants. And I will say like cryo ROP, I can tell you what it was, it, the threshold disease, but we don't, it falls into type one severe. So threshold disease was, it was zone one or two, stage three, and it could be either five contiguous clock hours or eight total clock hours of stage three. And what we found was cryotherapy reduced the risk of, of you know, retinal bad outcome, like uh, stage five ROP. The problem was in zone one eyes. The zone one eyes, there was an 87% risk of developing stage five ROP. And so we knew that we needed to relook at what stage three, you know, and what those zone one eyes are. And we also knew that we needed to go in a little bit earlier. So that's why we don't wait till threshold disease, if at all possible. The, because of the differences in ROP throughout the world, you, you screen for ROP based on the risk profile of the infant. So in the US, it's usually less than 1,500 grams birth weight or less than 30 weeks gestational age, but it also depends on the NICU. And then 30, at 31 weeks post gestational age or four to six chronologic age, whichever is older. And this is being a little bit adapted. So let me define post gestational age. That's the gestational age plus the chronologic age um, in weeks. So if you have a 23, or let's say something easier, 24 week gestational age baby who's 16 weeks chronologic age, right? That baby would be 40 weeks. That baby would be considered sort of term post gestational age. And the reason it becomes important is that some of the risks that we, or some of the, the risk of Type 1 ROP usually peaks at around 35 weeks post-gestational age, regardless of the gestational age or birth weight of the infant, which is interesting. And that's where I think we're seeing the importance of the development, because the photoreceptors and other neurons within the retina may continue to develop on their developmental, their clock that doesn't, isn't affected by premature birth, whereas the vessels are. So that's, think about that when you think about you know, the mismatch between neurons and vessels. So how do we screen? You can use indirect ophthalmoscopy where you can actually define 
this is severe ROP, type 1 ROP that needs treatment or should be considered for treatment. Um, you can also make the call, is the retinal vascularization to the aura serrata, so we can, you know, basically if it's in zone 3 without ROP and they've never had a Vastin, I mean, that's a, that's a big bugaboo, but I mean, that, that makes us have to examine them till they're fully vascularized. You can discontinue retinal vessels. Or you can look in and say, well, we, we need to examine again in one to two weeks or, or half, a, half a week, depending on the severity of the ROP. But we can also use imaging. And this is different. The imaging is very helpful, but it doesn't let us know whether or not a baby needs treatment. It lets us know whether or not that baby needs an examination to be considered for treatment. And that's called referral warranted ROP. So it's a consult for indirect ophthalmoscopy or examination. And that can be stage three ROP, shown up here. It, it's zone one or plus disease. So any of those can be considered referral warranted ROP. So these are the treatment warranted ROP. So as I mentioned, the type 1 ROP tends to be at 35 to 37 weeks post-menstrual or post-gestational age. The risk of blindness is 15%. It was reduced to 9%. And it includes threshold ROP, where there was a 50% risk of blindness reduced by 50% when we looked at whether they were in zone 1 or 2. Um, and this is what, um, and we already went over this, this is what type 1 ROP is. And, and the important thing, it's plus disease in two quadrants. Cryorop was plus disease in four. So here are some examples of type 1 ROP. You know, we think of this peripheral severe ROP where you have uh, uh, dilation and tortuosity and you have neovascularization. This is something called aggressive posterior ROP. And this is, this is different. This occurs usually in babies that are born 30, or not born, but they're often very young, post-gestational age, 32 to 33 weeks. They have severe plus and flat neovascularization in zone one or two. So you, you just, you don't see the, the typical stage one, stage two progression. You just see this neovascularization. And we call it flat neovascularization because it doesn't, it's just like you just see a fuzzy kind of appearance of the neovascularization at the edge. You know, basically, if you see a really posterior vascularized retina and there's plus disease, that's a concern. I also want to mention, you know, this is considered like a blonde fundus. I mean, we we're able to see the deeper choroid, right, vessels. When you're looking in ROP, you have to start at the optic nerve and follow the vessels out to the periphery because you can be fooled. You see those vessels in the periphery and they're actually choroidal vessels, but they're not, not the same as, um, as retinal vessels. So it can be an extremely uh, immature eye with poor vascularization of the retina. And, um, and it may, you, you know, don't be fooled by the choroid. So here's treatment. So treatment can be laser to the peripheral avascular retina. We tend to put the laser spots not too white, and they tend to be about a half a spot to a spot apart. This is an example of reactivation of stage three after laser. And what happens is in aggressive poster ROP, we tend to treat up to that flat neovascularization because we don't know if that's real vessel or physiologic vessels or abnormal vessels, but also because there's an increased risk of bleeding if you treat, treat that. And then after the regression occurs, you're left with a new area, what we call a skip area, and that needs to be retreated. So aggressive poster ROP almost always requires additional laser treatment, maybe two or three weeks later. But that's in aggressive poster ROP in zone one disease, we're finding that treatment with anti-VEGF may be a better way to go, at least at the present time. However, there are risks, and we don't know the right dose or the right uh, compound. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to go over this uh, a little bit. So why even think about VEGF in our OP? Well, first of all, VEGF is really important in normal vascular development. So that's worrisome, right? We don't want to inhibit it. 
but it becomes increased in diseases like that are associated with blood vessel growth into the vitreous. So diabetic retinopathy, neovascular AMD, retinal vein occlusion, it's increased by hypo in hypoxia, and that's because hypoxia-inducible factors, which are the tr transcription factors that, trans that lead to transcription of the EGF, are stabilized in hypoxia, and they're degraded in normal oxygen levels. And ROP is affected by low and high oxygen, uh, and so it seemed kind of logical that VEGF would be involved in ROP. But as I said, it's, it's, it, and it is important in pathologic and abnormal uh, vascularization ROP, but it's also important for normal retinal vascular development. And our lab looked at, at VEGF, and what we interestingly found was that, and PEDF didn't really play a role here. We were looking at that as an angiogenic inhibitor. But we found that experimentally, VEGF is increased early. And if you have increased signaling through the receptor 2, that that causes the endothelial cells to have these abnormal the cleavage planes and their mitoses are abnormal and they grow on top of each other. When you regulate the EGF, you can actually extend normal vascular development. So this was counterintuitive because at a certain level, you could actually inhibit the abnormal blood vessels and extend the normal vessels. But when we did more, and, and this was also found in clinical trials, that the first clinical trial was uh, the, called the beat Rob study where they used 0.625 milligrams of bevacizumab, Avastin, in a quarter of a microliter. I mean, you know, think about the, er the areas of error, right? I mean, these are being diluted, they're adult doses, we're using different needles, you're trying to do 0.025 mLs and inject into the vitreous. And they found that the bevacizumab reduced recurrence of ROP at 54 weeks post-gestational age compared to laser. But the other criticism about the study is that the laser, that's a huge amount. I mean, usually laser works in 91% of patients. So it was, there, there's been a lot of concern about that. Um, and it, it uh, permitted normal vascularization, reduced severe myopia, so nearsightedness, which also occurs in these babies and reduced recurrence of their ROP. But bevacizumab gets into the bloodstream and it reduces systemic VEGF for over two months. And VEGF is also important for the kidneys, the liver, the brain. So there are concerns about the safety effect. And then what about in the retina? So if you inhibit the way that Bevacizumab works, right, is that it regulates, it inhibits the binding of VEGF, right, to receptors 1 and 2. And receptor 2 is the <coughs> angiogenic receptor. That's what we want. But VEGF receptors are also on retinal neurons and glia, and so it can have abnormal effects by, by hurting the retina and, and neurons. And we found that in our experimental study. So there's an ongoing clinical trial now called ROP1, and we've used de-escalating doses of bevacizumab. And so far, we have gone down to 1 20th the dose of VROP, and that uh, is effective, but we still have bevacizumab in the bloodstream, and it still reduces systemic VEGF. So what about ranibizumab, or Lucentis? So it's a, it's, the, it's a different agent. It's a fab fragment of the humanized anti-VEGF. It has less systemic absorption, and it's a shorter half-life. But series report recurrences of ROP when it's been used. So how do we compare these two? So there was a study called CAROP, which only has 19 infants, and they used two doses of ranibizumab. So ROP1 was for type 1 ROP. But CAROP was for this more severe zone 1, stage 3, zone 1 NERP with plus disease, or poster zone 2, stage 3 with plus disease and aggressive poster ROP. So it had a more severe um, uh, 
phenotype to be able to be enrolled. And the successful outcomes were different. So this was looking at reduced type 1 ROP at 3 to 5 days. This allowed two retreatments for up to 28 days. And that uh, an unsuccessful outcome was, um, I mean, two retreatments after 28 days. An unsuccessful outcome was needing retreatment before that. So it's really hard to compare these studies. Um, this is, we've gone over, we've gone over that, but look at this too, the number. So in ROP1, we had many more zone one. ROP, or uh, care op, very few zone one. And zone one tends to be more severe. The ROP1 study had, so 23% that required either had early failure or late recurrence, and 18% avascular retina persistent, and CAROP had avascular retina in 45%, <laughs> and then in the higher dose had 84% avascular retina. So what about this avascular retina I'm talking about? That is, can be like a time bomb, and you can get recurrent ROP even up to a year after a single dose of anti-VEGFN and I. So most of us, or many of us, are considering lasering those eyes. So that does become important. Um, um, oh, right here, what I want to say too is that people keep talking about Carob or ranibizumab as well. It doesn't, it doesn't reduce the systemic VEGF for two months, but it does for two weeks. And if you require additional treatments, then you're still affecting systemic VEGF. So we don't know what that means yet. The rainbow study, this was similar to the CAROP study. It used two doses and compared to laser. So here we actually have a comparison. And it was zone one plus, zone two stage three plus, or APROP. And the primary outcomes showed that there was success at 70, uh, I mean, Success was in about 80% patients, and six, there was 62% uh, with laser. But there was recurrent ROP found in 31% with the anti -VEGF. So we, I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to. I want to make sure we have time, so I want to leave five minutes for the quiz. Um, this just says that we found that even with the ideal dose, worked out a way to have an ideal anti-VEGF dose by knocking down VEGF and Mueller cells so that the amount that was released into the vitreous was the same as what it would be in a full-term animal that wasn't in oxygen fluctuations. And even with that, we had thinning of the outer nuclear layer. So a number of questions, persistent avascular retina, we went over. It's different if the baby never had anti-VEGF. If they're into zone three, we monitor it. We may not treat it. If the baby had anti-VEGF, we either have to make a decision to continue to monitor that baby or treat with laser. And as they get bigger, they're harder to examine in clinic. Um, okay, let me see here. So these are the guidelines. Now, laser is still considered the standard for many type 1 ROP, but we, based on the beat ROP and other studies for zone 1, stage 3 plus, or hemorrhage, the recommendations are to offer bevacizumab, and we can actually, it's been published at a lower dose, so I often use 0.25 milligram now. Or we could use ranibizumab based on the rainbow study, which has not been published, but the, the clinical trial is out on clinicaltrial.gov. OK. So serous retinal detachment can also occur. It tends to, and that can be after laser or cryotherapy, usually not after anti-VEGF. It can resolve spontaneously, and, and sometimes we treat it with subtenons or systemic steroids. Progressive stage four ROP tends to occur after treatment where we start, instead of having a vascularized component, we actually get a scar tissue 
that forms at the junction of the vascular and avascular retina. And it can lead to a retinal detachment. This shows on cross-section in a diagram the retina being pulled up. And this is what it might look like on a red cam image. And what for that we do, we have to think about the risks, but we do a lens sparing vitrectomy or scleral buckle. Remember that there may be anesthesia risks. And that's, a, that's sort of an area that still be, we're not sure about. We're, we're getting, you need to talk to anesthesiologists. But remember the difference in the infant versus the adult. So in the adult, we have four to six millimeters to enter the retina without tearing the retina. That's the safe zone, right? Right through the pars plana. The infant does not have a pars plana. They, they, they haven't developed ones. They have a pars placata, and basically you have 0.87 millimeters in a full-term infant to be able to enter the vitreous cavity without hitting the retina. And you also want to not hit the lens. So we don't just operate on any baby, you know, we consider that. Um, and, and what are goals with a lens bearing vitrectomy? Our goals are to try to release this area, sort of the, the uh, connections between the retina and the anterior part of the eye, and also the circumferential retina and the anterior posterior. And we tend to start peripherally like this if we can, because otherwise, if you release this part of the traction, retina gets pulled out and it's too hard to get to. So if you can do that, we do. We're not always able to. I don't know if we have time. Oops. What happened there? That was interesting. I don't know what I did. So um, I can show you a little bit of a lens bearing vitrectomy. Let's see. We put in about 0.5 millimeters posterior to the limbus. And this just shows we're not, all this stuff here, which is vitreous and retina, we can't tell. You know, we removed, and this has been sped up too. Um, we removed the connections between the ridge and the anterior part of the aura serrata and also the anterior posterior ridge connections. You can actually see um, in some of these where the retina gets, starts to move, but we're not, I'm not even um, here. You can see how you pull on the vitreous, but I'm not removing that because I don't know if that's retina incorporated and you don't want to get a break in the retina they don't work and you have an inoperable retinal attachment. It's very different than adult surgery. And just to, oops, sorry about that. So this is how it started out and then this is how it looks. I mean, we don't have much macula, but it's, it's all settled back. So even though I did not release any of this, I mean, I didn't go after it, it just sets, it settles back over time. The RPE pumps out that uh, subretinal fluid and allows the retina to reattach. So all infants are followed for visual rehabilitation to maximize visual envelopment, development. And there's a high risk of myopia and strabismus, later risk of retinal detachment in high school. So I ask these parents to get them involved in early intervention. I work very closely with pediatric ophthalmology. That is absolutely critical to improve the visual um, because that's our goal. Our goal is to have these kids have vision. Um, this is just going over some of our fine, okay, so that's ROP. Now, I have four minutes, <laughs> and I, I do have some, some um, what I can do, I'm gonna give another talk on AMD, and I can do some of the, um, I can do some of the different um, cases that I have for different pediatric retina conditions, maybe then. Tell me what you'd like, because I want to have time to go over the quiz. Can you just get like a handout for like explanations for the quiz, or just what the answers are, we oh, can yeah, go over yeah. cases yeah. in person? Yeah, oh, yeah. Is, would that help? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So this is a four-year, is that okay with everyone? 
Do we have a pin set? Okay. Four-year-old boy with reduced vision in the right eye. You can see the visual acuity, the hyperopic. This is how the, uh, the um, fluorescein angiogram looks. So you see there's, how would you describe that, shrub? So, so there's uh, blockage in the inferior macula along the inferior arcade, and there's an area that looks like, I mean, over time may, may have been leaking, like. Good. You know, you know, Great. Like, and there's, it might be hard to tell, but there's actually a vascular retina here. So there, it looks like there's non-perfused retina. This is the OCT of the macula. So this is a fovea. What would you describe that? A lot of edema there, thickening of the macula, like cystic, ed cystic edema. Good. And then this is a full field ERG. Does anyone want to see what they see here? It sort of sounds depressed. Right, electronegative. So, in another way to think about, I think about it as the B to A wave is reduced so that the B wave is less. We still have an A wave. So, there are a few things that cause that. And kids, can you think of some of the things? Congenital stationary night blindness, right? Um, you can get it in severe diabetes, that's probably more adult, right? Anything that affects the inner retina? Or how about X-linked retina schesis? So that, that's a common ERG that's in fact many times we used in ERG to be able to make this diagnosis. But it's not like that all the time. So I think my that previous slide said 60%. So in a study done, now where we have genetic testing, that, that was only 60%. So the excellent retina schesis is caused by a mutation in the RS1 gene, which encodes retina schesis. And what we see are non-leaking foveal cysts. It's in a male almost always, although it has been reported in females. Um, it's associated with vitreous veils, vitreous hemorrhage, peripheral schesis, and it's passed on the maternal side. So if you have someone with Turner's syndrome, for example, they might have excellent schesis, but that's unusual. It's, it's not very common. We really don't know what retina schesis does. It can be produced by cells and important adhesion. Some people, Field. Maybe it's important in the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Um, there is a mouse that develops retinal degeneration as well. It's been clinically to have four, or four types. And this child had laser within the schesis because of the vascular retina. I thought, oh, what a neat thing that's going to get rid of the neovascularization. And it did to a certain degree, but it's, some of it's still persistent. So that neovascularization, I think, is probably also from just pulling on the retina and chronic traction. So there may be other reasons why that's present. Okay, all right, any question? That was quick, but this gives you, so this, is, this is a lot quicker than early. <laughs> okay, so five-year-old boy who has poor vision in the left eye, no family history, no history of trauma, right eye is totally normal. Okay. So, what do you see here, Rachel? So at the macula, it looks like there's, um, it looks flat, it kind of looks like a, like scar tissue that's there, but then there's some uh, like pigmentary clumps. Okay. I see the periphery too. Yeah, good, we will do that. So just describe what you see by color. Well, it looks, it looks yellowish, like atrophic. Good, and you can see the vessels kind of go over it, right? So it's in the retina, it's not on top of the retina. Right? It's a little hard to see that. So as you said, look in the periphery. So what are you looking for there? Um, Maybe massive exudation, right? <laughs> and centrally, and telangiectasia. Okay, that's the key. Anyone have any clues what this is? Perfect, okay. So if we do an angiogram, the thing that we used to treat before angiograms, we would treat Coates disease based on seeing where the telangiectatic vessels are. What we've learned is that the retina actually can have pretty extensive non-perfused retina. And if we treat that, we, it, it improves the outcome in Coates disease. 
So what about the prognosis of visual acuity here when we look at the OCT? I'm going to tell you, in case, unless somebody has it, knows. So the AG dates are under the retina. So they're between the photoreceptors and the RPE. And that's usually associated with poor visual outcome. So, um, and this is just tells us it's, uh, it's in young males 80% of the time. But that means girls can get it 20% of the time. So don't forget when you get a girl that has something like that, that it, it can't be coats to these, it can. Um, it has this light bulb type of aneurysms, telangiectasia in the periphery can cause um, macular exudates. And it can be bilateral, but that's, um, so it can actually be bilateral as far as non-perfusion retina is 60% of the time. And it can even have some vascular abnormalities. But when you have truly bilateral Coats disease with exudates and severe, you should think of conditions like facial scapular humeral muscular dystrophy. And usually you, there might be other conditions associated systemically that you, that you get that. Um, wide angle fluorescein, anti-VEGF is controversial, may reduce vision for corneal retinal anastomosis, but the primary treatment is, is laser. And if you have um, severe Coats disease where there's retinal detachment and that can occur, then again, you don't want to put a hole in the retina and treat it as you would like an adult retinal detachment, you have to drain from externally, do a, a vitrectomy and a laser and sometimes silicone oil. So here are the stages of Coats disease that have been determined where we get telangiectasia only, telangiectasia ex, uh, foveal or, or extrafoveal. Retinal detachment can be subtotal or total. That's stage three. If you have a total RD and glaucoma, that's stage four. An advanced end-stage disease is often painful and may require an ablation. So even with stage three, which would be here, and I'll show you uh, an example of that, or maybe I won't show you an example of that, um, but that it may not be associated with good vision, but it's worth treating it to preserve the eye and to save some visual acuity and potential in the, in the future. So I'm gonna, this is the patient after he, did, he developed 2060 vision, so not terribly bad. He, he had some amblyopia that had to be treated. He's not really good now about wearing his glasses, so his vision's dropped. So the amblyopia treatment is essential, yes. So which areas are we aiming to laser in these patients? So, good question. Okay, so what you do is you treat the telangiectatic areas here with so what I use is very low power, continuous. So I put it on continuous settings, and I paint the vessels. And then I do scatter treatment in the avascular retina. OK, this is a 10-year-old with reduced vision, best corrected visual acuity, blurred vision thought due to Coates disease in the in the macula. So here is his OCT, and this is through the through the superior macular region. But look at his fovea. Beautiful, right? So his prognosis for vision should be excellent. 13 months after laser, he looks good, but he still has 2070 vision. So Sophia, what do you think? <laughs> what would you I'll just show you. That's his refraction. So he was treated for amblyopia. And his vision improved to 2025. So remember to treat the amblyopia, always. Work with your pediatric ophthalmologist. It's critical. So coats, wide angle fluorescein, valuable to assure full treatment. OCT and discerning cause of vision, whether it's from exudates or whether there might be something like amblyopia. And value of anti is not clear. So we're going to be working on that. So three-month-old female referred for persistent fetal vasculature. This was the other eye. So not, that's OK. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to go over. Mm -hmm. These are great. <laughs> I could stay. Thanks. So 
late frames of the angiogram. So no, this is a girl. We think about a number of things, right? When we have a vascular retina in the periphery, what do we think of? So more like you can think of ROP again. ROP, right? Not premature though, but that's a great thought. What about familial exudative vitreo retinopathy? Incontinentia pigmenti, okay, so incontinentia pigmenti occurs in girls, okay, but it's, it's almost 100% of the time associated with rash. So no rashes, no family history. You might not get family history of, of it because it could be a sporadic mutation. No hair, tooth, or this is all with incontinentia pigmenti. Anyway, so this was fever and she had laser treatment to the periphery. She had an LRP5 dominant mutation. This has only been reported once. Mother has also the same mutation and she is entirely normal. This condition is so, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. So uh, it, it can be very variable and it can be very variable between the eyes, right? So there can be a peripheral avascular retina in a child or infant who is not born premature. It can be exudative or fibrovascular. Treatment can be laser to the peripheral avascular retina and vitrectomy for retinal detachment. And anti-VEGF is still exploratory. So we don't, even, even though, the, and we're, I'm gonna give you all the, the actually genes here, there can be genes in the wind signaling pathway, which are NDP, Frizzle 4, LRP5, and T-SPAN 12. This is not ZNF408, and there's also uh, other CTNN1, which is, I think, through beta-catenin. But even though we have all these genes, 50% of the time we don't find a, a genetic variant. So, and KIF11 is also another uh, mutation. LRP5 mutations can be associated with osteoporosis and osteopenia. Um, and for those uh, children, you need to consult with uh, endocrinology because they can have bone density issues. And my patient did, and she actually had a break in her femur. So this you can see anywhere. Um, it can be variable. This patient also had fever from Frizzle 4, and she developed um, a uh, tractional macular detachment from an epiretinal membrane. Her sister had a regmatogenous detachment, so totally different. And then just fetal vasculature can be a number of things. I can also, do you get copies of my... Do you get copies of the talk? Uh, send it to Elaine, then she can send it out to us. Okay. Yeah. Persistent fetal vasculature can have anterior findings or clear lens. Surgery to release trait. This is not accidental trauma. I want to go over this briefly. So it's from probably shaking, blood trauma. It can cause schesis cavities in all layers of the retina with bleeding, but it can have subhyaline or sub ILM bleeding. And sometimes, you can, you have to get imaging, right? But sometimes you can have the baby, if it's right in the fovea, they'll end up with amblyopia, or they can get anisometropia. They can get very nearsighted by having blockage of light to the retina. We can do surgery to release that, to reduce the risk of amblyopia and blindness, but sometimes what you can do initially is just have them sit in a car seat when they're awake, and then gravity settles that out, out of the vision visual axis. So I don't know if that, they can still get weird um, staphylomas, but that at least preserves their foveal structure. So it's something to consider um, in those cases. But you know, many times people will say the, the brain is so damaged it's not worth it, but I think we should try because sometimes the kids who have severe brain involvement from the shaking can still later have visual potential and outcomes. I'm sorry, we're leaving. Okay? That's it. I'm sorry.